Best Podcast Ever is sponsored by the Gertzberg Law Firm, a full-service, award-winning business law firm in Cleveland and Chagrin Falls that appreciates what matters most to businesses, practical advice, and cost-effective results. We understand your business because our team has the unique perspective of having real-world business experience themselves. Learn more at GertzbergLaw.com. While you're there, be sure to check out Cover My Six, a proprietary legal audit that will identify, target, and minimize your business's exposure to lawsuits and government investigations. Go to CoverMySix.com to learn how you can prevent a lawsuit before it starts. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to listen to the best podcast ever recorded. I mean, we all saw it from start to finish. We watched a man die for almost nine minutes screaming out for his mama. Twice he screamed out for his mama. If that didn't affect you, and if it didn't affect you deeply, you better really take stock of who you are. Ian Friedman, how are you? I am well, Alex. Thank you. Good, good. I can't tell if you're telling the truth or lying because you've got a mask over your face, but I'm assuming that because you're a good dude, you're always telling the truth. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But I do have to say this is my first interview ever with a mask yeah. on, and uh, so, yeah, happy yeah. to be here. Yeah, we're. Um, I think that we are all going to have a lot of firsts with masks on for a while. <laughs> I would agree with you. You've had. Have you had your first uh, uh, trial with a mask on? I have not. I okay. have not, thankfully. And okay. it's it's something we're dealing with right now. When do we return to trial? Yeah. Uh, you know, as a criminal lawyer, uh, trying a, a case with, with a mask on just is not doable for a, a number of reasons. So we're looking at it. Yeah, well, and, and you know what, we'll get in a few minutes, I want to ask you about yeah. the challenges of, of litigating with with masks on where you can't read witnesses' facial expressions. But I want to come back to that in a second. Tell us who you are. So uh, again, I'm Ian Friedman. I am a criminal defense lawyer. My office is, uh, we're based in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I do basically kind of the gamut of criminal defense. Um, you know, I do a lot of cyber crime as well. So that kind of takes our practice really you know, all over the country and, and, and in fact, uh, uh, overseas quite often. Uh, the world has been made very small, as, as you know, with uh, technology. I'm also the current president of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. Uh, and in my uh, 25th hour of the day, uh, I also teach. I'm a law professor at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, where I uh, teach uh, cybercrime. How long have you been practicing? Uh, I have been practicing. It'll be 22 years in November. So Wow. Um, criminal law the whole time? Criminal law the whole time, yeah. I was intent on becoming a criminal defense attorney, and then I realized, um, I think I told you, I worked for Jerry Messerman yeah. in law school, and then I, I said, you know, I just don't think I want to work as hard as you guys work. <laughs> well, um, I, I think you work plenty hard. It's just different work. Yeah, yeah. But had you always wanted to be a criminal defense attorney? Yeah, so believe it or not, I did since I was a little kid. Uh, my mother actually had a uh, videotape of me in the uh, fourth, fifth grade, fifth grade, uh, arguing against the death penalty uh, uh, in class uh, in the debate team. And uh, so I've always wanted to be. But uh, oddly, I, I, not oddly, but ironically, I wanted to be a prosecutor, always wanted to be a prosecutor. And uh, so first year of law school, first week, I went to get a prosecutor's job. They had a hiring freeze. Uh, so I uh, was recommended to a criminal defense lawyer, went over there, and I was really upset about it when I got the job because... I didn't want to be on that side. Mm. And uh, my father told me at the time, he said, well, you'll learn this side. And when you go back to the prosecutor's office, it'll help you to be better. And uh, it became very apparent uh, right away that I was exactly where I was supposed to be. So everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and, and I imagine that the last 22 years of representing criminal defendants has informed a lot of what you are doing today and a lot of what you did on Saturday. Um, so, uh, I, I came back into town and I saw your video, uh, blasted all over the place and, and there you are in black and white giving this amazing speech at the protest downtown. Talk about what got you up on that stage. And I encourage everybody to listen to it and watch it. It's all, it's on YouTube, but there'll be a link to it, um, in the show notes for this episode, but. Uh, what made you get up in front of everybody, those thousands of people, and, and say what you said? 
Sure. So, you know, we're obviously in a, in a horrid time right now. And, and I believe this is one of those times in history that we're never going to forget. This is going to be a defining time for us in the country. And I received a call Friday morning uh, from uh, two gentlemen, um, Abdul Karim Nafi, who's the head of uh, Black Lives Cleveland, uh, and also Jerry Prim, uh, who is a uh, minister uh, here in town and uh, also the head of GPAC, which is another uh, African-American um, a civic group that uh, helps um, uh, prepare uh, African Americans and other people of color uh, for um, roles in leadership uh, throughout Cleveland. And uh, they called me very early Friday morning and they said, you know, Ian, um, we would like you to speak uh, tomorrow at the Black Lives Matter uh, rally. Um, and I'll give you kind of the background in a moment as to how we got there. But I will tell you that when I first was asked, um, candidly, I, I kind of was a little nervous. You know, I've spent my whole life giving speeches, whether it's, you know, 12 people on a jury or large groups. It's what I do. But this was, I was very nervous about this because um, I didn't sleep well. And uh, my wife asked me, she said, I don't understand why you're so nervous. It's what you do. In fact, I never even bring notes into a courtroom. I never have. Yeah, that's what you said. You said you, you, it's always extemporaneous in, in, uh, in courtrooms. This is the first speech you gave that you'd written out in advance. It was. Yeah, that's right. And she asked me why. And I said, cause I'm terrified. And she said, what are you scared of? And I said, I'm scared to not be perfect here. And I really was because I felt like this occasion needed perfection Mm. Um, I wasn't sure why I was asked, um, but I really kind of gave it a lot of reflection and then that night, so actually it was Saturday morning from about 1230 in the morning till three o'clock in the morning, I wrote it because it finally dawned on me, what do I have to say? And it was a speech directed to the white people, um, because African Americans have been calling out, crying out for centuries, literally. And it falls on deaf ears. Everyone gets up in arms when, you know, uh, when a, they see a black man on television being killed, but then it fades and and then the next one happens. Um, I felt like if, if there was ever to be a chance at stopping this, the, you know, what, what they had asked for that morning, they said, look, we need the establishment. The establishment is white. Uh, you're the president of the Bar Association. And we, you know, I've forged a relationship with, with these gentlemen and with the groups they represent and the other activists in the community over the years. And uh, I've really come to understand from their perspective best I can, right? And so it was a it was a speech to the white people called Complicity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was blown away by how direct of an indictment it was that, that, that came out of your mouth. I mean, it was you... You spoke directly to white people and said exactly that. Said if it, it, you're, you can't close your eyes anymore, right? Yeah. You're you're, and if you do nothing, then you're complicit. Why is this? It feels different to me, yeah. but but you know what? I have to tell you, I've said that before. Um, realistically. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, in one way, it's different because for, for, for you and I, because we just walked out of a, a, a protest. Right. And, and you are and this is happening while you are in the role that you're in. Right. Mm-hmm. You're the head of a bar association that, Correct. by the way, has six, six thousand, Correct. six thousand lawyers, uh, many, if not most of whom are white um, and white collar workers. Right. That's um right. Uh, probably not in the lower demographic, in the in the poor demographic, right? Um, but other than the fact that you are in the role that you're in and leading all of these people in a very real way, is that why it feels different? Or do you think that there's actually something different happening? Yeah, I think the answer to that there's both. It's it's two, it's yes to both. And and here's why I say that. Number one, When I told people that they've seen it and they can no longer close their eyes, everybody saw George Floyd, the gentleman in Minneapolis, under the knee of that white officer, held down by two other officers and shielded by a fourth. You know, when we've seen things in the past, people don't want to believe, you know, things happen. And, you know, oftentimes 
viewers, um, you know, they question, well, there has to be other sides to it and what else happened. And, you know, and they give themselves the excuse to kind of just drift off from it. But here there was no getting around it. I mean, we all saw it from start to finish. We watched a man die for almost nine minutes screaming out for his mama. Twice he screamed out for his mama. If that didn't affect you, and if it didn't affect you deeply, you better really take stock of who you are. Because if that didn't reach out to you, and I don't care from what walk of life, then there's something seriously wrong with you, and I'll say it. Uh, so I think that is different. There's no way to unsee this one. There's no other story to it, number one. Number two, I think you're right. I think my responsibility as the leader of the bar uh, is to make sure that we are addressing uh, inequality and, and you know, making sure that people all have equal access to justice. And when you say that, it's not just the courts. It's from the, just the initial interaction with the police, you know, right up until the final experience with the court. Right now, I can tell you, after all of these years, there's two sets of justice, yeah. period. So uh, I think for both reasons, I felt like this was the perfect time. And if you were to ask me what it, the impact it made on me, I could simply state it like this. If not now, when? Yeah. I uh, hope that you're right, that this is different. But I'll be honest with you, Ian. Um, what you described just now, I felt before. I felt it when we were watching that, that black kid get um, choked Mm -hmm. uh, by police, like his name escapes me now, which is horrible. But um, you're right. We didn't see Tamir Rice. Talk about Eric Garner. In Eric New York. Garner. Yeah, yeah. That was on video. Sure. Right. It was. Um, you know, I don't know, man. I I hope that you're right. It certainly is true that there there seems to be a bigger crescendo in the protests when protests turn violent that seems to get everyone's attention although not in a good way mm -hmm. um i think that that is diluting the message um and and um and that's a problem but well, so so talk about from a practical standpoint make a prediction what do you think is going to be different going forward knowing who's in charge right right um and and, and knowing that it is systemic make a prediction well, you really you do recognize the obstacles, Alex. I mean, there's no there's no question. We're not going to get the assistance from uh, from the White House. It's not going to happen. In fact, it's it, it's an impediment, and I'm not going to go political on your show here. But we're we're going to. It's going to be tough, and I think that any sort of change is almost really going to have to be at the individual level, and people are going to have to see the leaders come out at the local level and make change might be small change to start, but it's really going to have to be a ground level effort. Uh, and until it catches on, I'm with you. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not disillusioned to think that this is going to be easy. And in fact, you know, in speaking to a number of my friends, uh, both white and uh, African American, you know, a lot of them say, yeah, we've been here before sort of thing. I just, you know, I don't want to meet my final day and, and right. think that it didn't happen because I didn't try. Yeah. So, you know, I know that I am. I know that there are others like me. The Bar Association, we are committed, um, you know, to doing our part. We hope that by doing something here, and we believe we can effectuate change here on the local level, that that model uh, will catch and hopefully spread. And hopefully others are doing it in other jurisdictions. I mean, we're seeing these protests. And yeah, unfortunately, the media is focused on the, the looting and the rioting. You're correct. It's it's taking away from the message. But also you and I just left a peaceful protest in Chagrin Falls where the future, you know, our hope, the kids are out there peacefully protesting. We have to do the best we can so that when we hand off that baton to those kids, they've yeah. got, they're going to have to bring it in. Yeah. I view history as a series of pushes and then pulls back, right? Pros and cons, whatever you want to call it, right? So the way I answer the question, I think that there is inevitably going to be forward progress. We will get there um, by inertia, by, and it's, and unfortunately it's going to be one murdered black kid at a time, right? I, I, cause, cause this, things like this don't stop on a dime. 
right? Um, I think it is, it is I, I view it in the same way that I view the civil rights movement and apartheid. It is a slow moving inertia that just event, you eventually get there. And what pulls us back when we try to get there is talking heads, right? There is um, this symphony of, uh, of, of, of talk radio hosts and mm -hmm. just saying why you're not racist. You're not. You're you're a concerned citizen and you're just protecting your family and protecting your business and that's fine and that's okay. And by the way, I agree with that, but it, you can also be racist if you just open your eyes mm -hmm. and see that there is this disparate impact. Um, so th that, you know, I, I think the extremist voices out there is what pulls people back. Mm -hmm. I just think that they tend to um, be out done by the forward progress of history. History moves in a progressive direction. It just happens slowly. It happens one incident at a time, one outrage at a time. And one and and certainly with technology being what it is, I think that you're right. I think that so long as there's more body cameras, more cell phones, helps. More yeah. drones, yeah, that does help. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's bringing it to light. I mean, I there's absolutely uh no way uh, that those officers would have been held accountable had it not been for an innocent right. bystander sitting there uh, with the cell phone camera, or several of yeah. them, obviously, from all angles. Otherwise, this is just another day. Yeah. Let's let's get practical again. Yeah. What is the, you know, I, I'm, I'm laughing. Um, uh, you and I talked about how, I mean, you're the outgoing president of That's the right. Bar Association, That's right? right. Well, how, <laughs> how many days do you have left in that role? So I got about, uh, let's see, the end of the month. Uh, so where are we now? About a little three weeks uh, yeah. to go. So you threw down the gauntlet for the next guy. I sure did. <laughs> right? I do. I've, you know, Joe Gross is our incoming president. What yeah. a wonderful guy at Benish. Uh, and we had an executive meeting today. And uh, we were to talk about his agenda for the following year. And we never quite got to it yeah. because we were talking about what we're going to do now. And, uh, you know, the great thing is, though, he's embraced it. The Bar Association as a whole has embraced it. And even if Ian Friedman stepped away, it's moving forward. Good. Now. So so this isn't new. You've been working on access to justice reform yeah. for the at least the last year from what I've been paying attention to, but right. really your whole career. Yeah. But as head of the Bar Association, um, what have you seen and implemented? What's happening now, and where is it going? Yeah, so it's been an you know um, it's been an incredible year. We were kind of laughing that it seems like every big thing hit this year. I mean, it, it, we've had more things happen this year than probably the ten years preceding. We got in. Uh, le the Ohio Legislature wanted to. Uh, you know, change the tax exemptions for lawyers, first thing. Uh, the second thing, the Justice Center uh, is getting, you know, are, are we going to stay? Are we moving? Where are we moving the jail? Yet the politicians wanted to make that decision on the taxpayer dime and not include the lawyers in the discussion. We asked nicely to get involved. We kind of got put off. We had to kick the door down. We're in the discussion now. COVID came. That's changed the entire landscape, obviously, of the world. Uh, as it relates to law, the Bar Association almost overnight had to change to a complete virtual platform. We still, in 30 days, have done 55 seminars as to how to uh, get going. Uh, what happened uh, here to uh, Mr. Floyd uh, was, you know, was absolutely uh, uh, horrid, and we're dealing with that now. When you left out, in between all of that was um, the, 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 all the investigations of the of what was happening in the Justice Center, the abhorrent conditions. That That's were right. that that the the inmates, and then there was that that uh, serial podcast that was within the last year, I think. Yeah, right? so that came out. That's right, right at the start. So uh, uh, the podcast uh, that really showed the guts of yeah. the justice center and what was really going on there. Yeah, uh, that's helped to open up people's eyes. Uh, we've been working on the bail reform uh, all year. We've been uh, we've collaborated with our administrative judge, Judge Brendan Sheehan. Uh, to put together a uh, COVID-19 legal task force so that we don't run back into the courtroom and put mm. people in peril. Uh, we put together, uh, we collaborated with, um, I was called out to Ashland, Ohio uh, on, uh, let's see, end of May. A young lawyer was called to trial, to a jury trial. The judge wanted to be the first one out of the gate to say, see, we can do this. So he called me out there after the judge had him start uh, swearing in the jury. And I get out there. Uh, and all of a sudden I've got on a, a, you know, the mask and neoprene over my face. And despite the judge's best intention, it was so unsafe. 
Yeah. And so I knew at that point that if we didn't say something, other judges who wanted to get out there, um, cause not everybody believes that COVID's that big of a deal. I mean, it just yeah. depends where you are. And, uh, you know, in our 88 counties, they all look at it very differently. So I said, uh, you know, we've got to do an advisory to the courts to get some sort of uniformity throughout Ohio. And, um, so it was, it was a great collaboration. Not only did we have, you know, my colleagues in the defense bar, but we worked with the Ohio Prosecuting Attorneys Association. I brought in all of the stakeholders from the courtroom who all have unique needs. And we put together a 92 page report in the matter of 10 days from April 2nd to April 12th. Uh, the chief justice uh, of our Ohio Supreme Court, Maureen O'Connor said, please do it. Uh, we had the court reporters, clerks of courts, as I said, the sheriffs, mm. um, uh, bailiffs, everybody was involved. And it really is an incredible report. And so I submitted it to the court. Uh, they've now distributed it to the 722 judges around the state. But more than that, I think what I'm most proud of is I've been getting calls over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the, uh, the Indiana uh, Supreme Court's uh, reviewing it. I've gotten calls from the New York Bar, New Hampshire Bar, New Mexico, California. And that all started right here in Cleveland. Yeah. So Lots happened this year. You will not be uh, accused of thinking small. <laughs> yeah, um, <no. laughs> uh, getting back to access to justice. Yeah. So George Floyd happens. Right. And I think that you and I probably both um, agree that it, as horrible as it is, it is an opportunity. It is an accelerant. Certainly, you've gotten a lot more visibility from your from your speech. That happened because of it. But what 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 do you think as it relates to the bar, um, the bar association, the bar itself, and, um, and and just criminal justice reform, how is that moving? How is that changing because of this? I think this right now has really called everyone together, those who want the change, those who are starting to recognize that, yeah, this really is, um, you know, a systemic disease, and it is. Um they're coming to my fear is that if we don't do something yesterday, people will who have the luxury to be able to go home and just kind of change the channel or yeah. forget. And so, you know, I, I know that the bar association right now, we, we recognize that because as you said, we, we look at history also, uh, and we are intent in moving now and not letting people forget because I think that it would be criminal to let it go. Criminal, not yeah. in the sense of a criminal violation, but a yeah. more like uh, from a more of a, a moralistic standpoint, we cannot allow this to pass. Yeah, I have to re just as an aside, I have to remind people all the time that when you look back at some of the heroes in, uh, throughout history of um, forward progress, the things that we take for granted now, lawyers were a part of every. I mean, yeah. the protest marches, the, the folks that drove down uh, with the Freedom Riders, um, those were lawyers. Those were young lawyers uh, fresh out of law school, and they were there to help people vote, to help people march. And you can go all the way back down uh, through history to, to revolutionary war times. Those were lawyers in, in that in that group of founding fathers. Um, and, and so here you are leading them, right? And I, I just, I, I, I want to get as specific as as I can with you, um, because you're here and I've got your attention. Hey, I'm I'm open game. I, you <laughs> yeah. know me well enough yeah. now to know I'm not going to hold back. So yeah. you ask it, I'll tell it. So so as a as a practical matter, are we talking about changing the law? Are we talking about prosecuting corrupt police officers? Are we talking about? Um, uh, changing uh, enforcement regulations. I mean, what specifically do you think the bar is going to be doing in the coming weeks, months, years mm -hmm. because of this in spite of, I don't know. Yeah. Right? So all the above and whatever it takes. Okay. So if there is to be true acceptance, if there's to be modern policing, if there's to be acceptance of all, if there is to be uh, equal treatment, you're going to have to have, just a complete sweeping change yeah. of how things are done. Our tactics today that have been utilized have been in development for decades and decades. I mean, we're a militarized, uh, you know, kind of policing uh, now. And, and that's fine to have that available. But now when you've taken it down to the street level to 
Um, it's, it's unnecessary and it's not equally applied. You and I, Alex, don't have to worry about a police officer on our right. necks. Right. Okay. And, and until people are as outraged about what they saw to, to Mr. Floyd as they would be if they saw it to you or I, then everything and anything has to be done. How, uh, how challenging is it to break through the blue wall? Incredibly, incredibly. I have a lot of very dear friends in law enforcement and good, good people who I would trust with my life. And they hate the bad officers. Hmm. You know, they wanted to be officers since they were little kids. Like we wanted to be lawyers yet. The culture Mm. is such that if they come out they're they're ostracized, they're, they're put out there and that's the problem. And so when I, called on the officers on Saturday uh, during that speech, I recognize that there are far more good than there are bad, but the problem is until they start calling out the bad ones, they too are complicit, just like us if we don't speak up. Yeah, um, It's incredibly difficult, and the law is set up to protect them. You know, you've got uh, the, the uh, unions uh, with all the collective bargaining that allows them. That's why we saw this officer in Minnesota. We have 17, 18 violations, uh, you know, disciplinary stuff, ethics, civil rights, the shootings. He's still there. That's one example, but I see it all the time. When I get an officer who I know is going to testify in trial, I'll always get his disciplinary file. And just about every single time, they've got a stack of allegations. Now, granted, an allegation is just that, but sometimes... You know, like a prosecutor would say against one of my clients, if they had a number of offenses where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, that's got to hold true also to the pro- to the uh, uh, police. I don't think people fully appreciate that there is a psychological camaraderie that happens when they have each other's back. I was in the army, and I was in an, for, for politically speaking, I was probably it, it, well, not probably I was in the. Um, acute minority, right? I, I was surrounded primarily with uh, uh, by by folks who are very conservative and who um, really good guys, right? But I mean, it, it, it when you are placed in a situation where a you've come up with them, you've been in stre- high stress situations with them, life or death situations with them, um, we relied on each other in Iraq to save each other's lives. I would have done anything for those guys and vice versa, right? Um, and then, but when you try to pierce through a system of, of injustice, it's the same thing. You have each other's backs. You have each other's backs. When somebody is threatened with discipline uh, for, for screwing up, I mean, I would never, uh, I, I can't think of a, of a way to justify on moral grounds those police officers looking the other way. But I understand the psychology of it. I do, too. And that's what has to be broken. And that really is it goes right to the heart of your question. So is it difficult to get through? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they also know they know that how hard it is to get to them. I mean, we've brought cases Look, we've had officers lie. And again, I'm not one of those defense lawyers who says all cops are bad. Right. right? I really believe that the, the bulk, just like any profession, they're great. And they're well intended, but the bad ones are the ones that give a bad name. Right. And those that we've seen in courtrooms who have proven themselves to be dishonest or to abuse the law, you bring some sort of case against them in federal court, and it's extremely uh, difficult to overcome the yeah. qualified immunity that they have. So the problem is feed that into it also the camaraderie, the protection, I got your back sort of right. mentality, as you say. And then also, yeah, and you know what? Look how many times people have been busted and nothing happens. Yeah. So there's, so we're, we're really, you know, your original question as to what's it going to take, it's going to take a full scale effort. And that's why this is the first time that we've seen the institution of the bar association, the lawyers, 6,000 of them now rallying to say, yeah, you know what, we have the resource and we're, we're going to call it out now. Yeah. And, and, and I have to mention, I, I asked you last night, um, whether you got any backlash at all, um, from from any lawyers and uh you and you said just the opposite everyone's been incredibly supportive um 
you had one guy uh, who yeah. who uh, was the exception, but uh, out of out of I know there's hundreds, probably thousands that watched your video, and the fact that you got so much overwhelming support makes me uh, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Um, yeah, no, it was great, and you're right. It was one, and the, and the one person who spoke out didn't say that what we were doing is wrong. He just wanted us also to bring attention to, you know, the rioting and the, the yeah. looting and all of that. But, uh, as of last night, I had had over 400, uh, text messages, emails, phone calls with everyone saying, thank you. And we appreciate what the bar is doing. So we know we're right, but this, isn't, this is an easy call. Yeah. Like we didn't make a hard decision. We just said, what's right is right yeah. and let's go towards it. Well, and if anyone, I have to say too, I, I, I kind of had this, this epiphany after we got off the phone last night for any lawyers that are on the fence or aren't sure. I think what, regardless of my political leanings on this and regardless of, uh, you know, even if I didn't, uh, you can't unsee the video obviously, but you have to, remember why you went to law school. You have to remember why you are a lawyer. It is because you believe in the rule of law. It is because you believe that it is special, that it is sacred, and that it must be enforced uniformly. Uh, racism does not have a role in that, you know? And, and, and so to me, it, you're right. It is such an easy call on the facts and what you see, but it's also to me such an easy call as, a, as an attorney. You know? Yeah, you know, it's you're absolutely right. It's every single day of my life, myself, my colleagues, we seek justice in an unjust and an unjust system. So it's like mm -hmm. great. It was a little drop in the bucket. You know, you're right. You have to look at history. And I would always tell people, you can never go wrong if you look back historically. You can never go wrong if you're pursuing what's right. Right. And that's why it's so easy. When people say, what do we do? The starting point is what's the right thing to do? Now, granted, some things are not so clear cut, Yeah. but things like this, this is an easy decision. And to sit back, it's not why any of us went to law school and yeah. you don't have to be in the criminal justice system. None of us went to law school to be unfair, but you know, we, uh, the system steers people in different directions. Sometimes it becomes more about win and lose shouldn't, right? Shouldn't have any place in the system. Uh, and now we are given that opportunity, uh, unfortunately, on the back of a dead man hmm. uh, to, to uh, you know, steer the ship and turn the ship in the, in the right direction. Let's talk about protests. Yeah. So unfortunately, the message is getting diluted yeah. and people are afraid here in Chagrin Falls, we have a fairly conservative demographic um, I am, you know, at, at this law firm, all, all, almost all of our clients are businesses and business owners and from the, um, and talking to them as business owners, you hear the business owner's perspective. You, you hear, um, concerns about property damage, for example. Um, and there is a subtle, you know, like I, I don't really begrudge people for having fear, I think fear is a natural reaction, right? I mean, you see bad things happening. You don't want them to happen. You're afraid of them happening. It's a natural thing. Um, but I have been so disappointed over the last couple of days, uh, the the high school student who, who initially organized this protest here in Chagrin Falls and then felt so pressured and intimidated uh, by... I can only imagine people of all ages mm -hmm. uh, and people who did it both anonymously and um, uh, not anonymously, right? And you're a high school kid and there's only, I, there's only so much of that kind of pressure you could possibly take. Right. But I want to talk about the idea that despite the violence mm -hmm. that's out there, despite the vandalism, despite the fact that in some cases it is a fact that Antifa or some, or at least that's my understanding, there are in some cases people coming in to cause problems. Yeah. Talk about your views on the importance of timing, the importance of having the protests go forward despite those things happening. How have you observed the cancellation of the protest, the fact that it's gone forward? How have you 
observed and opined on all of that. Yeah. You know, let me just be clear as to what happened Saturday, because there's so many different stories as to what happened in Cleveland with all the destruction. Okay. And look, there's no doubt that everything's, it's really sad. It's unfortunate uh, as to what happened with, you know, the broken windows and so forth downtown, because the rally itself, it was beautiful. I mean, it was like thousands and thousands of people there. And I would say probably 40% were white people. And, you know, lots of lawyers were down there, just professionals who said, I've had enough. And the African-Americans, you know, I, I was sitting there with Bishop Eugene Ward and he looked at me and he said, Ian, I have never seen so many white people come to, to a rally like this in all my years. It really was fantastic. And the support, the unity was great. You know, I could point my fingers at a lot of different things that happened that day. Um, yes, there were people who uh, came in. There were people that, um, you know, were not there for uh, pure causes. It was not the Black Lives Matter movement that did it. And I want to be real clear with that because I was right there. Um, you know, I can't speak to what happened afterwards, but you know what? I mean, once that tear gas started going and once you had kind of that crowd mentality going, you know, unfortunately it, it turned to what it did. Um, I don't like the fact that I understand the business owners. I understand the town of Chagrin Falls being scared and I, I really do, but I really hope I've been disappointed so far. I will say that. You know, because I watched the the young man, uh, Chase, his name's Chase, um, you know, announce it. And I saw the adults come down on him. You know, everything. Oh, it's a health violation. It's, um, uh, you know, you didn't get a permit. Oh, I'm going to talk to the chief of police. You know, yet nobody's protesting all the, the line at Starbucks and no one's wearing masks. You know, it's like this is a big deal. We should be encouraging this young man and and, you know, his the other students and young people who want to uh, express the, the hurt that's out there. And, and so I was really bothered by it. I stood up for him. I reached out to him. We spoke. I really did want to help him. Um, I don't know where all the rumors began, you know, that all of these groups were coming in. Um, I checked with all of the groups that everyone was worried about. And they said, and we have no intention of coming out. And I think Alex, if anything, what we saw today, nobody was coming except peaceful protesters as a community and communities surrounding people really just need to come together. I think the greatest deterrent for outsiders, you know, who want to just ruin things is a show of support in the communities to say, we are all together. We do not tolerate uh, this sort of behavior. You know, we are an open arms community. And even for those who have never practiced that, it's gotta be so much nicer. I mean, yeah. The hatred has been so unnecessary and this cycle is never going to stop until everyone literally comes together and says, this is all of our community. I could go on and on on this podcast, but you know, um, so I, we know that the young man has now, um, rescheduled it till, uh, you know, a couple of days. And I hope that the people see today that it really was a nice expression and we should encourage uh, everyone to come out. I hope that the next one in a couple of days will be even bigger and, uh, and it, and it will only help the community. Those who don't get it or don't want to get it more so, um, you know, if they don't want to hear it, they're not going to, I hope that those who don't, but aren't like opposed to it. Those who say, no, I'm not racist. I support, you know, um, you know, minorities and so forth, you know, but there's always that, but, or they feel like they always have to qualify yeah. by saying I'm not racist. I hope they'll be there because it's not just that overt racism that's out there. You know, the people, like we saw the truck going up and down mm -hmm. main street, uh, you know, with, you know, yelling out at the, the protesters and so forth, but it's the implicit bias. It's the cultural bias. Yeah. It's the stuff, how we look at people. So look at Amy Cooper, the, woman in Central mm -hmm. Park who saw the gentleman bird watching and called 911. You know, she said, I've never been racist in my whole life, but yet there she was. And that was a perfect example of such a greater uh, issue. You know, I'm sure that woman and all of her friends would say that they're very liberal and accepting and so forth, but there they were. Yeah. And so I think there needs to be a great dialogue here in this town and many towns, you know, as to, do we just board up our windows, keep our heads down and hope that nothing bad happens? Or right. do we become a town known for its tolerance? 
big questions, and this is yeah. a great time to address it. Yeah. Um, so, Ian, this is the part of the show where ordinarily I would ask a series of inane lightning round questions. Do it. I'm all good. And I feel like it would be um, a, a really missed opportunity if I didn't ask some of them because Please. I've got you in the chair in front of a mic, and I'm not going to ask all of them because some of them are really inane. Um, but there are a few that I'm, I'm just so curious about, about what your answer is going to be that I'm sure. going to fire them away at you. Okay. Uh, Ian, what's a misconception people have about you? Oh boy. That is a good one. Um, a misconception. I have to tell you the first thing that I'll give you the first one that came to my mind and I may regret saying this, uh, but people think that I just kind of bulldoze through everything and that things don't bother me. They do. They really bother me. Like I go home and thank God for my wife because she's my sounding board. Like stuff doesn't just bounce off of me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is a misconception because I assume that to do what you do, yeah. you have to have steel nerves and check everything at the door and just, go, and be able to just turn it all off. I wish I had that, yeah, but maybe not because the care inside of me, I guess, right. is what causes me to do it. But it takes a great toll on me. It does. Like when I hear negative stuff, bad stuff, it doesn't, as I'm getting older, I'm better at deflecting it, but I've not been good at it in the past. I do take everything to heart. Mm. I do. Um, conversely. I feel like I'm in a therapy session. Uh, well, the the other the other the other um, the other way to, I, I've been thinking about these questions is um, there are uh, uh, questions that colleges ask kids on college applications. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> so here's one, right? But I didn't I didn't get them that way. I no, just, I'm good they, with it. This they, will actually help. Yeah. So. <laughs> What's an assumption you had for a long time that you later found out to be totally bullshit? You know, I have to tell you something. I don't ever assume. I heard something a long time ago. I used to teach street law at Shaw High School when I was in law school. And the teacher there has been there forever, Lori uh, Uragdi Eiler. It's been a long time. She wrote on the board one time the word assume. Okay. And she said, you know, to the kids, she said, what does this mean to everyone? And everyone kind of gave their definitions. And she then said, she broke it up and she said, to assume makes an ass out of you and me. It always stuck with me, yeah. and I make no assumptions at all. I never do. In fact, when my clients say, what do you think? You know, what? just what's your bet? I don't. I never speculate. I don't mm. assume nothing. So that's why my hesitation was there, because I just don't. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's unusual. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think most <laughs> people are, uh, me included, I, I, I try to catch myself making assumptions. That's the best I can do. Yeah, I have, you know, I recently disclosed to my wife, I'm turning 50 this year, by the way. So I'm, a lot of these questions are good because every night I'm like, I'm looking back on my life now, this 50, you know, people say it's just a number. I get it, but it is hitting me. Yeah. And so I've been asking myself all these things and, um, you know, it came to me the other day. I said to, to my wife, I said, you know, I have to acknowledge I have made many more wrong decisions than right in my life as it relates to me, to me personally. And so it's probably good that I don't assume cause I'd be yeah. far yeah. Uh, much more wrong than, than right. Right. So I go in, I keep an open mind and whatever it is, it is. Yeah. Um, what is the non-religious book or author whose words you apply the most in your life on a day to day basis? Well, that's easy. That's uh, the, you know, I, I read the letters and the thoughts of, of Gandhi and of Martin Luther King. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. I always have. That's easy for me. Huh. I have to pick that up. I, I, like, how do you, you, just, you got, you have books that just have their speeches and, and yeah, text? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I'll, I'll, that, you don't have to go get it. I, I I'm going to get that to you. Wow. And I read it once in a while and it, it puts a moral compass and it puts hope and it puts yeah. what's right back in back in oh that's so me. interesting um i will read it um i'm halfway through um the autobiography of nelson mandela right now same same sort of thing yeah so same thing there's great similarities and in fact a lot of the sayings are overlap between martin luther king and gandhi yeah. and and i'm sure nelson mandela's in that same ilk because 
right is not complicated, yeah. right? So right. it's just how you say it. Well, and and what I've found, you know, there's books that, that you read that you just feel yourself changing. Right. Uh, you feel your mindset changing, and that's mm-hmm. one of them. And the, the, the way that I've found that book changing me is letting things go, right? Um, I keep coming back to this guy spent 30 plus years in prison yeah. and he came back to love the people that put him in there. Right. You know, if he can do it, he is just a human being. He's just, he's got the same, you know, blood and, and bones and, and everything that I've got. If he can do it, you know, I mean, what am I, what could I possibly be pissed off about? That's right. Enough, enough to hold a grudge, you know? Well, you're exactly right. And that's the lesson I took from Mandela most was letting go. Yeah. You know, because all the things that we carry with us, those grudges, yeah. means nothing, but it eats at you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I heard a quote the other day about that. I love it. Anger is the poison that eats its own vessel. Yeah, it, it does. And it, and, you know, only in the last couple of years have I been able to release it. But I, I stay focused on stuff. I mean, yeah. unfortunately, if, if somebody did something that I thought was, um, you know, threatening to me or someone I care about, it was just wrong. Yeah. Unfortunately I carry it with me and, um, you know, it's still something mm. we work on ourselves our whole lives, I guess. If you were a professional boxer, what song would be playing as you entered the ring? I don't know. Um, it would probably, I can't give you the exact song. Um, but you know, I, I, I just like rap. I always feel better when I'm listening to rap. Is like, that yeah, right? yeah, rap, R and B, hip hop. That's huh. that's what I listen to. Um so you know, I don't know if it's Tupac or Fifty Cent. I'm not sure, but it's Is it's somewhere right? in there, yeah. Did you grow up listening to hip hop? Yeah, I've listened to everything, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Way I back too. when. Yeah. So that that's pretty much what I listen to. It's that's my vibe. That's yeah. my you know, I feel best. That's when my best energy is. See, I really enjoy going back and listening to the things that I grew up with, but I oh, can't listen. Sure. I can't, but I can't listen to modern hip hop at all. I just, I don't, I, no. I, don't, I don't connect to it. Yeah. There's uh, you know, my daughter, my, uh, was listening to something and I said, what is this? And she told me of the band was, I was like, I can't believe anyone's listening to this. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's the way like my parents and grandparents right. thought about my stuff, but yeah, I, I, I really like the old, you know, R&B, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, I listen to everything, though. I mean, it, so my my most peaceful place uh, is is outside listening to James Taylor, period. So the opposite of boxing, if, if I am to feel at my best, mm. I'm with my family, I'm outside somewhere in the woods or the water, and James Taylor's playing. James That's Taylor, he's great for your soul. Period. It, yeah. Unbelievable. You can't, you, it, it, uh, you're right. It melts, it melts the stress away. It does. And yeah. that, that's my one, um, big splurge every year, wherever yeah. James Taylor is, I get front row tickets. I go, I take my kids, you know, if it's one of those things where you can do the meet and greet. Yeah. So in my, uh, office and in my daughter's room, we have big frame pictures from him that he signed. Uh, and it has my favorite quote, uh, of all time, which I live by. Uh, and one of them says to Daddy and Maddie, and the other one says to Maddie and Daddy, and it just says the secret of life is uh, enjoying the passage of time. And I really um, try to follow that because we don't know how much time we have. As you know, you know, I got no bad accident years ago. I was upstairs for a long time, and uh, I look at things very differently now. So there's not a minute that goes by that I'm not going to take advantage of. And perhaps if we're circling all the way back around, when people say, Ian, you got three weeks left of your bar presidency, can't you slow down? No, I got three weeks left to get three weeks worth of, of work done. And that's just what it is. Cause tomorrow the lights may be off and I just want to make sure I never wasted time. We're going to end on that. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I appreciate you. I appreciate everything mm-hmm. that you're doing. Um, and, uh, you're doing important work. Is there anything you wish that I would have asked you? No, this, this was, uh, this was great fun. Uh, Good. I'm going to be thinking about some of these answers on my way home. <laughs> yeah, and, of course uh, you are. Yeah. 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 But I, but um, no, I really, I thank you. I, I'm honored that you had me. Yeah. And uh, this is a great program. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for doing this and, and keep doing what you're doing. And um, I suspect I, you're going to be easy to find over the next couple of, of weeks at least. But um, um, I suspect that we will be hearing more from you and about you um, and uh, at, at, 
minimum of uh, folks, if you scroll down on whatever you're listening to, if it's, well, if it's a computer anyway, uh, you'll see a link to Ian's speech uh, from Saturday night um, and uh, probably some things from the Bar Association um, and, and support him and support uh, the movement. And, uh, and, 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 and Ian's uh, uh, final words here, I mean, use this moment. Don't let this, this go to waste. This is a time to, to, to make change happen. So let's make it happen. Ian, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. See you guys next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we thank you for listening. And remember to check out the Gertzberg Law Firm. Whether you are starting, running, growing, or transitioning a business, or if you need to create or update your wills, trust, or estate plan, our team will give you an incredible level of personalized attention and a passionate commitment to meet your objectives. We are veteran-owned and our award-winning lawyers have the highest ranking from Super Lawyers and AVO. We have also recently received the coveted Weatherhead 100 Upstarts Award for a second year in a row. And we are among the first Ohio business law firms to offer our clients a non-billable alternative on every single matter we handle for them and opt out of the billable hour. What we are most proud of, though, are the many things our clients rely on us for. We successfully defend them in court, but we also help them avoid the courtroom with our Cover My Six service. We protect their assets through good estate and succession planning, and we assist our clients in many non-legal business services like recruiting and business development. We want our clients to feel confident in their choices and to help them resolve any issues or potential problems quickly and efficiently so they can get back to what they love, running their businesses. More than just litigators, we are trusted advisors, problem solvers, and growers of businesses. Let us help you and your company. Call us or find us online to learn more. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.